this car is the most honest car you ever see. It's been a dream ever since I've had it. The first time I heard that engine screaming, I thought, I gotta have one of those. For me, the cars have personality. What's great about a BMW Classic is the community that surrounds it. When you listen to that, <laughs> that's why we're here. Welcome to Classic Heart, the BMW Group Classic Podcast. This is JP, and our guest today is Daniel Hoffman from Berlin. Daniel will tell us a very emotional story, which I'm so glad and pleased that he will share this with us in this episode. But before we jump into more details, Daniel is a true car nut. He is absolutely car crazy. I met him through the Flitzer Club community from Berlin. So with no further ado, Daniel, how are you? Very good. Thank you. Happy to be here and thank you for inviting me. Uh, that's a that's our pleasure. But before we jump into this deep conversation, uh, would you like to tell us a bit more about you? So is your profession in cars or how is your relation to cars? No, it's not uh, my profession. It's more of a passion that I have there. Um, Profession-wise, I'm an entrepreneur, so I uh, try to build great products and uh, companies but I grew up with classic cars and I'm very excited about them. So I spent a lot of time with classic cars and sometimes it feels almost as if it were my profession, at least time-wise. <laughs> I mean, that's a good distribution of time if you have also some spendings of your precious time for cars. Um, what would you say is one of your earliest memory related to cars? That would probably be um, around Nürburgring. We lived close to Nürburgring and uh, it was close to Trier, little village, 45 minute drive to Nürburgring. And uh, my uncle lived 10 minutes away from Nürburgring. So the whole family is uh, closely connected to Nürburgring. And I would spend every other weekend more or less there for 24 hour races, touring car races, Formula One, Old Timer Grand Prix, etc. Or just to watch the average, normal, non-race driver people um, uh, race around Nordschleife on an ordinary weekend. Those are the first memories, I would say. And we don't want to reveal your age, because I think that could be inappropriate sometimes. Uh, not with you, because you're still very young. But what time are we speaking about? Was it the 80s, the 70s, the 90s? Yeah, those were the mid-80s, I would say. Early 80s to early 90s, roughly. So the glorious time of DTM, where all the heroes <laughs> yes, were racing yes. there. Yes, yes. And um, even at that time, getting onto Nürburgring was quite expensive in terms of tickets. Did you have some sneaky ways as a local or did you always pay tickets or did you just jump over a fence or something like that? I don't remember exactly. Um, I know that we paid a couple of times because my dad said that Formula One was quite pricey at the time, <laughs> but I don't remember exactly. I think there was some story here and there about uh, us knowing one of the the guards there and uh, you just say hi and get in, but I don't exactly remember. I mean, that were the golden times because uh, I mean nowadays everything digital, the ticket uh, process is very complicated. I think you need to have a degree in studying where you can go with your ticket and we're not at modern day uh, race car events. I'm uh, really looking back with a with a tear in my eye to that time when I also went to races uh, at that exactly at that same time. Yeah, Nürburgring changed quite a bit over the years. Uh, I've been there uh, last summer for Oldtimer Grand Prix again and it's quite different from the way it was in, in the past. Um, it's gotten more professional, yeah. uh, as you've just mentioned, uh, more digital. It's also changed a bit in terms of uh, of the vibe. I have the feeling. Um, I think that's interesting. Would you like to describe the difference in the vibe? Like, has that also changed in terms of cars? Because I think nowadays you see so many high expensive GT3s, other uh, Porsches uh, and stuff like that. And if I look at uh, old cam stuff you find on YouTube of guys who were filming, you see like little escorts and stuff like that. But do you think that also the attitude of the people has changed a little bit? Well, for sure, I think that the um, the cars and the, the performance spread has uh, changed, meaning it increased. Uh, today, there are still some rather slow, normal street cars. And then there are those, as you mentioned, GT3s that are just 
surpassing uh, the other cars with 150 kilometers more on their uh, odometer. And it's getting quite dangerous here and there. And uh, yep. to my memory, I was quite young in, in those early days, but uh, it was different back then. There was more more uh, tight racing going on and those performance differences were not nearly as big as they are today. Yeah. And did you also drove the Lodge Life in your history? Not in that time in the 80s and, and 90s. Um, I only got my driver's license in 1995. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it took me a couple of years until I had the right car and felt uh, ready and up for Nordschleife. Yeah. Um, I did drive it a couple of times over the last years and I enjoyed it a lot every time. It's a really exciting racetrack and very unique racetrack uh, for sure. But it's also quite an effort for the cars. So, yeah. and since I'm a fan of classic cars, I don't I don't really do that too much because, really, the cars, the street cars, are not really up to something like Nordschleife. So I I try to preserve them and not do that too often. Tell us more about the first time. So, what car and what was the feeling? I have a 993 Turbo that I drove with and. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to race it to the limits uh, on Nordschleife. And I also realized that after one or two rounds on Nordschleife, I would already feel the material, the uh, the tires, the brakes. Uh, I would feel that they are already under stress. So I, yeah. I didn't push too hard and um, drove maybe at 80% or something. And I was absolutely thrilled with the complexity of the racetrack. Uh, it's mm. really an awesome racetrack. I loved it. And um, I'm, I'm not one of those at home racers as my son is uh, so i i don't know the nordschleife by heart and the the turns and how to drive into them so i i took it rather slow and uh, and then those gt3s and other super and hyper cars just raced past me and uh, it was a bit scary as well it was quite an experience very exciting lots of adrenaline that's for sure i mean this is a very like challenging track it is as magical as it is but it is challenging for as you mentioned for the material and also for the pilot yeah daniel would there be a let's say a way in history where you would have become a race driver honestly speaking i think i'm a bit too scared for that so uh, i i don't really like driving to the last limit mm. knowing that if something goes wrong uh, things might turn turn really bad. Maybe 20 years ago, that would have been a bit different. I certainly did a couple of things where I now looking back, I should have taken it uh, more easily in the streets. But uh, race driver, I don't think was ever really an option. I totally understand you because I tried racing quite a bit a long, long time ago. And I felt that I'm not I'm not having it like I don't have the guts for breaking late and, and stuff like that. And I'm so happy to see some of my friends doing it very well. And Walter Rowe said to me, well, because I asked him, Walter, why do I don't drive nice results? And uh, he said, JP, you just don't have it. So leave it. And I did. And I think that was a very wise uh, decision. Maybe I wouldn't have uh, been able to walk or be in a life if I would not have followed that, that remark. Um, but I find it always fascinating, the communication between the track through the car to your brain. I think that's something so crazy. You you feel every little thing which is uneven in the road. You just know, okay, now I'm a bit too quick because you just feel it in your in your stomach, right? The G-forces, you feel that. And I find it fascinating because if you go with a normal car on the autobahn, uh, you don't feel that. Yes, I can very much relate to that, yes. So, bottom line for us too, no racetracks. It's safer for everyone. <laughs> but still we love driving and in my opinion we found a perfect solution and alternative towards driving on the racetrack and that's driving with friends so uh, we're both part of the flitzer community in berlin and i think it's time now that we share the story about the flitzers so daniel i couldn't think of someone better to tell the story so what is flitzer It's a really, really nice community that I have met a couple of years ago. And it's organized by a guy that you know very well, Dirk, uh, who organized it. And he really assembled this wonderful group of car nuts that meet quite frequently to drive their classic cars, mostly Italian, mostly 60s, 70s, some 80s cars, 
through the countryside of, of Germany, sometimes also Switzerland. We meet maybe four or five times a year. And it's, a, it's so wonderful because every time we meet, we share more memories together and yeah. uh, the community just bonds closer and closer. And the cars are just fantastic. And we, we all share this passion and we all share that pain that we're suffering sometimes from this passion because we have so many horror stories in this group of, of flitzers about our cars breaking down, falling apart and yeah. uh, costing ridiculous amounts of money to get them fixed and back on the street. It's wonderful. It's a lot of a lot of fun. And it's also, it's classic cars. It's a bit of art. It's a bit of architecture, some culinary highlights yeah. here and there. It's, it's a really wonderful mix. Thank you, Dirk, if you're listening. I'm sure he will. And I think also what's so special, is it like that Flitzer started uh, like loose community with people who were sharing a garage? I think that's the story. And then it became a WhatsApp group. And from WhatsApp, it uh, turned into this... Uh, Dirk doesn't want to say if we say club, because it is actually not a club. Because I think that's... The, the, well, he the, calls it Flitzer Club. <laughs> so it's, it's he kind does, of sort but, of something like that. Exactly, but tell him that he has a, that he's running a club and he will like be no 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 it's not a club. I think club is not Berlin enough. I think, but it, what I like is uh, there is this little subgroup in between the Flitzers called I think the Italian Broken Car Club or something like this. Yeah, Broke Italian Car Lovers Club. I exactly, think is exactly that like was, this. that's what we called it at the end. Yes. yes. I think then we should do something like for the Titanic uh, German way car of car owners who can also be part of that one. So I think it's an obligation for you and the others uh, with German or even with, I think there's also French cars present. I think there's a Peugeot sometimes participating of the Mr. Doctor. Um, so it's a, a great fun. Uh, but, you know, what makes it so special for being a flitzer for you? There's a couple of things that, that make it so special for me. Uh, one is really the group of people. It's a really well-chosen, I think, group of guys and gals, and, and they just match in a certain way. They're yeah. uh, all a bit crazy, a bit leaning towards beautiful things. They're all open. Um, none of them has any I'm something better attitudes that you yeah. sometimes find in, in certain clubs or, or car or brand communities that just doesn't exist. Um, last summer, there was an F40 uh, and an Enso, I think, joining us. And then there was also a, a Fiat 850. Um, yeah. And probably the value difference is times 200 or something. <laughs> and it just didn't matter. We were all standing there together and chatting and it just doesn't matter. Um so that this openness of the community is something that I, I very much enjoy. There's no snob factor at all. Yeah. And then also the passion for these cars is something that really unites us. We're all into the 60s and 70s era of cars and accept all the suffering that comes with them. So it's, 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 a, it's a really wonderful mix. And it's probably even more about the people than the cars. But the cars obviously are also very important. I think it's fair to say that the cars are the the link between meeting yes. wonderful people. Yeah, it is not about cars because cars without people would be only a piece of metal, shed and rubber and plastic, and that's it. So I think that's maybe the beauty. a bit more. But uh, <laughs> yes, I'm exaggerating. For sure, there's yeah. a lot of other people. Yes, sure. So could you also be a member of the Broke Italian Car Lovers Club, or is your focus on different cars? I do have a 1963 Maserati 3500 GT, mm -hmm. and that was a pain to get into the condition that it is in today. So I'm definitely a member. And uh, before that, I owned a 61 Lancia Flaminia Touring mm -hmm. uh, GT uh, car, which is sort of the sister uh, of or brother of that Maserati. And that also was a, a pain to to get into the shape that I wanted it to be in. So uh, I've had my share of suffering with old Italian cars. And I, for sure, I think am eligible for this community and group. For entering the club. Okay. Yes, yes. And um, is it fair to say that you can consider yourself kind of a collector? Yes, I've never looked at myself as being a collector and Probably I have to admit that some aspects of being a collector apply to me, but I really do like to drive the cars that I own. And 
that might be something that's differentiative to the stereotypical collector. I love to go into the garage and just own the car and yeah. see the car and touch the car and enjoy the car just sitting there. But I don't get nearly as much joy as I, I want and need to get out of those cars if I don't drive them frequently. Yeah. So I'm maybe in this regard not the typical collector. Um, I sometimes argue uh, towards my wife that it also is some kind of an investment, um, which it is, of course, not in monetary aspects, at least not for me. Yeah. But um, And that might be a collector view on things then again. So I'm, I'm a bit of a collector, but also a passionate driver. And it's an investment in having a good time. So an investment in fun. Yes, that's exactly how I see it as well. And um, I think, you know, At the end, we also the BMW Group Classic podcast. So I hope that we can speak about a bit BMW because there's one very special BMW in your collection. The name is Mike, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And yes. it's a very special BMW M1 and very special, not because it's an M1 only. It has a very touching story behind it. Would you share that with us? Yes, um, I'm happy to do so. And I will start a bit further back. Yes. Um, I, I joined an executive MBA program in, in Pittsburgh, in Pennsylvania, 1999 and 2000. And since it was an executive MBA program, uh, most of our co-students were uh, a bit older. Uh, one of them was a guy called Mike Levinson, whom I very quickly became a very close friend with. Um, he was a lawyer and then he became an aerospatial engineer and worked in that field at the time that I met him. And then he, as a third study, added business administration to it. And we spent wow. a lot of time together, did a lot of assignments uh, together. We hung out a lot in his uh, apartment, chatted a lot about classic cars back then already. And uh, mid-2000, I had to leave Pittsburgh to work a while uh, near Los Angeles. Then I moved back to Germany to finish my studies. And and Micah and I, we stayed in very close contact. We met in L.A. He visited me quite frequently in, in, in Germany. He was traveling a lot through Europe. So he would uh, come over every now and again to join me for some, some classic car events. Nice. Um, and... Over that time, we also both started to build our classic car collections. Um, mm -hmm. We discussed a lot which cars could be interesting, which cars would be fun to drive, uh, what the qualities and the uniqueness of the cars are, etc. So there was a lot of talking about these cars. And his first car that he bought, first really valuable car that he bought, was an M1 that I now um, am lucky to say is my car. Mm -hmm. It was his biggest uh, pride and... Then he bought a, a Honda NSX a NA2 version, the last version Very of those cool. cars. Wonderful car. Yeah. And then a blue over beige uh, BMW Z8. Legend. Um, An absolute BMW legend. Yeah, that is also a funny story because one time he visited me in Berlin to go on a road trip with that uh, Lancia Flaminia that I mentioned. And Mike was a very tall guy so you have mm -hmm. to imagine him in that really tiny Lancia Flaminia going on a classic car <laughs> rally so it was an interesting trip but the day before we went on that trip I, I told him hey I have to show you something and we went to my garage and I showed him my BMW Z8 at that time I had a black over black Z8 mm -hmm. um, and he drove it and he was so excited about how that car handles and drives that he flew back after that road trip and i think two weeks later he called me and said daniel i found a beige over blue 5000 mile uh, z8 that he bought so yeah. two weeks after he visited me he bought that z8 <laughs> but anyways that's uh, not what i wanted to go to so a year later he visited me to participate in that first uh, flitzer tour um, mm -hmm. my first contact with flitzer And that was 2019. And we wanted to participate in that tour. But the day before the tour, he didn't feel so well. So we went to a doctor. The doctor sent us to the hospital. And after a couple of hours, he got diagnosed with uh, pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we, we were both completely numb by this news. Um, he refused to stay in the hospital that day. And we uh, next morning, we joined that Flitzer event. And... Um, We had a wonderful day with the Flitzers, uh, and next day he flew back to Pittsburgh to start battling cancer. Um, yeah. He uh, he fought for 12 months, and um, he when when he was close to 
losing that battle, um, I flew to Pittsburgh to see him again and say goodbye because it was it was clear that time was about to come to an end for him. And um, that was probably the most challenging trip of my life, yeah. uh, I must say. And um, but during that trip, he, he during those days, he told me that he wanted to pass that M1 on to me, which um, uh, also again created this feeling of numbness in me because I was so overwhelmed with the sadness of, of losing my dear friend, and then the thankfulness for this this incredible present that he wanted to make to me. Um, so, uh, to cut a long story short, um, today I. I'm really sad about that loss of my dear friend Mike, um, but I'm also thankful to have that wonderful memory, um, the M1 that we called Mike with an uh, with a one as uh, mm -hmm. the I in the name. That's that's why we called it Mike. Yeah, so I, I have this really exciting car and a wonderful thing that I can connect with my dear friend as a memory. That's a very touching story, and I mean it in the most honest way, because uh, it shows how abrupt and uh, how immediate friendships in one world can end, but they are staying on because the, the friends and family, which has passed away, unfortunately, they don't leave us, in my opinion, because as long as we think about them, as long as we keep them in our memories, uh, they will stay forever with us as long as we are around here on this planet. And um, now I could imagine, like, every time you think about it, and one, you think about your friend Mike. Everyone, yes. Every time you step into the car, you have that memory. You see his face smiling while driving, I just assume. And then I think that makes it very, very special. For me, this story, I mean, it's always tricky to speak about stories like this because... Uh, It's uh, sad on the other hand, but also so beautiful in the other sense that you upload so many positivity with a negative thing that happened to someone onto a car or an object. And um, as he was truly a car geek, and now we pass on some big, big shout outs to, to Mike up there uh, listening to us as well, <laughs> yes. most likely. Um Do you treat the car with all these memories and this special history? Do you treat it different than other cars you own? I don't treat it differently. Um, I I look at it somewhat differently, and I would never, as long as I can remotely afford to maintain the car and drive the car, I wouldn't even remotely consider selling it yeah. or giving it away. So it's it's really that that precious memory in my garage. Um, so it's in a way it's it's different, but then again, I I treat Mike the car just the same way as my other cars. I want I want it to be in the best shape I can get it into, mm. and I want to drive it and enjoy it. And even though Mike, my friend, never never said that, uh, I think he obviously hoped that I would exa do exactly that with the car to enjoy it to to share it with the community yeah um he explicitly told me dude if you want to if you want to sell it sell it you don't have any obligations do with it whatever you want but i believe the reason why he it was given to me is that he knew that i would treat it in a way that he would have treated it and yeah. uh, that he would appreciate so that's what i'm doing and, and mean, i'm happy to share the story here And again, thank you, because um, that's it is as tragic as it is. It is a wonderful story. It is the best outcome of a horrible thing that happened, in my opinion. Yeah. So thank yeah. you for sharing it with us. And I mean, I also like the fact that you took Mike to a large Flitzer tour. So you took the person, Mike, your friend, Mike, to a Flitzer tour, and then you brought his car back to a Flitzer tour, and I think it was the first uh, Flitzerland tour through Switzerland, wasn't it? Yes, yes, exactly. Mike passed away in uh, 2020, and then I moved the car, imported it to Germany, and um, had a, a couple of things that needed to, to get fixed in order to get it on the road properly. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, fall 2021, it was ready for the road, and 
it it was perfect timing because shortly after I received it and registered it, the uh, Flitzerland event took place with the Flitzers. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful trip. Um, it's such a great car to drive, which I didn't know. I, uh, I mm. mean, it. then that's also different from the other cars that I looked at for a long time. I researched, I I reviewed, I tried to drive them, etc. But this car, it just as I said, it just came to me. So I didn't really know what to expect. And then I, I just bought it the car and started driving it rather spirited uh, in those in those mountain roads. And I was just overwhelmed by the quality uh, of this car. It's a fantastic driving machine. Yeah, I can highly recommend anyone who ever gets the chance to sit or drive in one to do that. We had Ben Clymer on the podcast in an earlier episode of Classic Heart, and he got also for him a very special M1. And he also said the same thing. Um, he barely drove a car that is so well balanced between usability and sportiness. And uh, for a long, long time, M1s have been ignored a little bit by the car community, and I don't know the reason why. They were always around. But it was not like um, they don't get the attention they deserve. Yes, um, I fully agree with what you've just said in terms of the recognition of the car, of the uh, car community. Maybe it has to do with the fact that it's a bit of a strange animal. It's uh, this this car company, car maker, BMW, that all of a sudden came out with this fantastic car without much of a history. Mm. If Ferrari had built the same car, it would be sort of one in a long line of similar uh, cars. Uh, so maybe that's part of the reason. Um, I don't know. But the cool thing about the car and why I'm also so excited about it is that it, it has all the drama of the 60s, 70s uh, Italian race cars. It has the looks, it has the 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 emotion when you when you drive it and at the same time it has this bavarian boringness in the interior and the cleanness and just the perfect engineering to it and things just work the way they should mm -hmm. and that is quite unique for cars of that era of those looks it just does what it should do which is to drive really really well to create a lot of emotions while doing so yeah and It's super reliable and still that dramatic, fantastic, exciting looking looking car. Yeah. You you described the drama. I think that's a very nice expression to describe the car. Uh, would you say that modern car designs nowadays lost a bit of a drama point or drama aspect in the design? I would say that modern super and hypercars, at least many of them, also have that drama at least looks wise to them there are quite a few of more contemporary hypercars that that i think look as dramatic as the m1 um, hmm. i think that it's just a completely different experience to drive them hmm. and that's where i think the drama went missing because you just bought these cars and then you hit the pedal to the metal and the thing just brutally accelerates and within no time you're exceeding any speed limit on any road mm. that you're on and you don't have to put any effort into it anymore and um, there's no struggle no joint fight for acceleration and performance anymore yeah in modern cars it's just that easy simple acceleration and performance that i think lacks drama yeah coming back to mike and mike You described Mike as a rather tall chap. Yes. How did he fit into the M1? Just about uh, he fit it. <laughs> <laughs> he was about uh, probably, I'm, I'm 185. He was about probably seven or eight centimeters taller. So he would, with his hair, scratch the, the ceiling of the car. <laughs> yeah, so it was a, it was a tight thing, um, but it didn't matter much. No, of course, it's, uh, you know... A look at me. I'm uh, I'm 140k. I fit also to, uh, stunningly. I fit to many cars, <laughs> not comfortably, but I fit. So, but I would like to speak more about the feeling driving an M1. And you know, aside of this very special story with with yours, but or like I would say with Mike and yours, describe this feeling like going to a mountain road. I think you go to was it Stelvio as well? Yes, uh, the Stelvio Pass. 
So how does the car act there? Is it like, yeah, describe it in any possible way. <laughs> well, the, the car is not really made for this super tight, windy hair needle turns because it is really, and you feel that in every aspect, it's really made as a race car. The turns are a bit wider. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a bit challenging here and there, but perfect road handling. The suspension is fantastic. Uh, you have total control. At least I felt I had total control at any time. And the sound is just mind boggling. It's fantastic. The, the sound of the engine, the sound of the transmission of the differential. It's just so many fantastic mechanical sounds in that car, more than in, in, in other cars that I used to own or own. And that is also a very emotional aspect of this car. And at the same time, it's super reliable. You can, in a re very relaxed way, drive it through cities or villages. Uh, in, in Switzerland, you would just roll through the villages and then accelerate again and then the car would tell you, come on, give me more, give me more. And you would you would drive it faster and faster just because you feel so so safe on one hand and it's so much fun to, yeah. to accelerate on the other hand. It's a great experience. And the engine is like magic, isn't it? Right? Yes, yes, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, gonna, it's fairly high revving. It's got just about the right power output, I would say, to mm -hmm. enjoy the struggle, as I mentioned. On paper, you would say, well, 200... 77 horsepower might be a bit little there but when you drive it you don't you don't feel it it's just the perfect experience of that fight for speed and performance uh, together with with the car so it's it's a wonderful engine and again here it's highly emotional but i talked to the um, m1 club and mm -hmm. we talked about the car when i knew that i i would own this car and they told me i think the word was the engine really is a Traktor. I don't know the English word, but yeah, it's a tractor, yeah. A tractor. So it's it's really it's almost impossible to break it. Yeah. And I really like what you say, like the Bavarian kind of um how you described it. I think you said cleaningness, but you said something else. I think a I bit think like, I said boringness. Exactly. You said boring, <laughs> yes. And I agree on that. I think for me personally, in the interior of that car is not exciting at all. It just does the job. It doesn't distracts you from driving which is a very important part yeah. but what i find so fascinating and i think actually what you described in a very nice way is it has italian blood with the german brain somehow because it is the drama is there definitely i mean jujaro did a great job in that look at this i mean but let's speak about mike again so in what color was mike painted The color is orange, and BMW built them in orange, also in red, um, a couple of other colors as well. And sometimes there's a bit of confusion um, uh, in the community uh, because it's a quite reddish orange, mm -hmm. but it is orange. But is that the is that Inca orange the color? I I was asked before if it's really just orange or not as a color code or name. And I did some research and I did not find any other color specification than just poor, boring uh, orange. I think it's just orange, but I'm not 100% sure. I mean, that's a perfect task for everyone listening to our podcast. So everyone who has an idea what's A, the color code or the color name of the orange of Mike, especially like for the M1, please share that in our comments or reach out to us. I think that would be a big help. Yes, and if there is really another name than orange for the color of that car, I'd be very happy to go on a little tour around Berlin with the M1 for the one who shares that information. Really? I mean, that's fantastic. So, even more. <laughs> Listen in, everyone. It's uh, for a tour in a fantastic M1. What is the true name of the orange of the BMW M1. Find that out and you get a free ride through Berlin with Daniel in Mike. I think that's fantastic. Thank you. What, what a nice idea. My pleasure. Looking forward to it. Mega. Um, we extensively, rightfully spoke about the M1, but let's speak also about other cars that you own. We mentioned the Maserati. We mentioned the Porsche. I really find the variety of cars in your collection very interesting. So how do you see 
the future of your collection? Do you want to grow it or is it nice as it is now? I think it's really more or less nice, uh, the size that it has right now. I really want to drive my cars mm -hmm. uh, and I want them to be in, in the best shape they can be in. And um, it's just a lot of effort, especially with those uh, bit more special cars. Um, but on my wish list is uh, the Z1. Really? Um, so that I think is a really exciting car. I really love the concept and many uh, design aspects, interior and exterior of the car. So one day I hope I will find a nice example and the time to to drive and enjoy it. What makes, because you said one, I think, you know, I agree. I love the car. I love the concept, everything about it. Um, the car did not get much love so far. So what makes it so special for you? I really like about cars when they when they clearly serve a certain purpose. Mm -hmm. And for me, the Z1 is that ultimate car lovers, outdoor experience kind of car with the the option to to put the doors down and then the you're really close to the street and it's a convertible and i i just think i couldn't think of a more exciting car to enjoy a, a very warm and sunny day and uh, drive through the countryside i mean i think it's uh, totally legal correct me if i'm wrong but it's totally legal to drive them with the doors down in germany at least yes i mean that gives you a yes. very special feeling which you only have from like a Willis Jeep or something like this, where you don't have doors at all. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, I, you know, for sure the car has all the magic that it could have, because, I mean, two great names in the car industry were involved, like Dr. Ulrich Betz, who uh, at that time became the head of technology development, I think kind of R&D at BMW. And, I mean, he was also responsible then later for the new race of Aston Martin. So I'm for sure they took care of uh, the driving experience. And then um, the design comes from a famous Dutch guy. Uh, so you see the Dutch connection in BMW is very strong. Uh, now with the head of design, Adrian van Hoydonk being Dutch, and then Harm Lagai, who invented the lines of that fantastic car. And I'm lucky enough that I met Harm very, very often, and uh, we're good friends. Uh, through the work at the Concorso de Ganso Villa d'Este. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, the funny thing is, Harm comes to uh, Villa d'Este always with his motorbike on the back of his car, and then he takes it out to do, uh, do some rides around Lake Como. <laughs> and I mean, we don't want to reveal his age, but I think if you take mine and yours and deduct 10, then we are right there. And he's so fit and so fun to hang out with. Such a great guy. So I think he would love the fact that you consider having a Z1 after owning a Z8, I think that's that means a lot to him. So, um, yeah, so everyone listening in, Daniel Hoffman is looking for a fantastic, well-prepared, <laughs> perfect condition, honest Z1. <laughs> um, Daniel, we are just at the beginning of the new year. What are your plans for tours? Is there anything you want to do, especially also with Mike? Have you planned anything so far? Um, I'm just about to start uh, planning um, the year. Just this morning, I signed up for for a, a Flitzer tour in May that Dirk uh, circulated the the info on. So I'm excited to go on on that trip. I'm a regular at the Espresso GT events that you might know in yes. Berlin. Every I think last Sunday of the month, everyone's meeting up. It's a cool, cool meetup um, with a wide variety of cars where I like to go. It's just a three, four hour um, thing in the morning. And um, it's it's easy to combine that with, with family life uh, without being away too long. And then there's AVD Rund um Berlin Classic, which I like a lot. So I might join uh, this year. And looking back over the last years, I would say that probably something like four or five two to three day car events will probably be um, what I feel most comfortable with. That's that's what I did in the past and that's what I enjoyed a lot. Great. Um, so, you know, we have a little bit of a service part always in this little podcast, which means uh, we ask our guests for some advice or for some ideas. So we know that Berlin has a massive car community, big variety. You just mentioned one, the Round Berlin AVD event uh, you mentioned the flitzer event um what is your advice for someone who would like to participate 
in kind of a car event with his own car that you like a lot or that makes you very happy to participate in? For um, a rally-oriented driver um, with an ambition to uh, contest his uh, his own driving skills, I think the CRC rallies, uh, I think it's Classic Rally Club, um, mm -hmm. that's also one of the rallies that I did with my dear friend Mike uh, when he visited me. Mm -hmm. Those are really fun events, uh, also around Berlin, more or less. Um, I think they're twice a year, and they're fun to participate if Classic rallying with timing and challenges is your thing. Yeah. Um, the around Berlin thing is a, I think, a multi-brand, um, very broad um, in terms of of cars and uh, models and brands and, and years. Also, so also a very nice event with a little less pressure uh, in terms of of challenges and classic rallying. I I really do like the. Um, Classic days on uh, Kurfürstendamm mm -hmm. that uh, is, is once a year. I think it's in fall. I very much like that for just the. It's a nice vibe. Um, there's uh, constantly cars coming and going, mm -hmm. and it's a, in a nice scenery. So I can highly recommend that. And um, in order to develop passion in in your children for classic cars, which I did with especially Jonathan, I can highly recommend uh, frequently visiting Classic Remise, nice. which is in the northern part of Berlin. It's always entertaining to go there and see new cars um, that are being restored or up for sale. Also a very nice place to go to. Exactly. For for those who don't know Classic Remises, so it is an old train depot, um, which has been converted into, let's say, a classic car hub in a sense, with like a restaurant, a coffee shop, some dealers, restoration and car storage for collectors as well. So it, uh, and the cars are always in glass boxes, so you can really go and have a look at them. So I definitely think that's a good idea uh, to go there on a regular basis, have a little coffee, having a chat. So I think they're very valuable uh, hints and advice as uh, what to do. Thank you very much for sharing uh, them with us. My pleasure. And um, I have to say, uh, Daniel, uh, we have to come to an end. So it was really cool that you join us. And also thank you for sharing the lovely story about Mike and Mike. Um, that means uh, a lot to us. And I think it touches also many of those who listened in and tuned in here on A Classic Heart. Thank you very much for joining us and taking the time. Um, we're sending our best to Berlin and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much, JP. It was the first time that I uh, had the chance to talk about all these things and I very much enjoyed it. Looking forward to meet you again soon. Thank you very, very much. So that was the conversation for today. I hope you enjoyed it as much uh, as we did here at Classic Heart. As usual, if you like what we do, please leave some ratings at the podcast provider of your choice. And of course, you find some further information in the show links and the show notes. So um, whatever you want to say is leave a comment and uh, we hope to hear you all again soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.